it is. It's wonderful. Here we go. It'll just come up in a wee second and then she'll let me know in the chat. So kind of, there we go. I think we're, we're going to be, yeah, we're good to go. So um, Audrey, welcome to Creative Commons 20th anniversary uh, summit, our celebration. And we're so delighted you had the time uh, today to, to join us for a conversation. Um, as you know, we you know we had you in our podcast very recently, and uh, we we know that you have been a, a huge advocate and uh, and 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 so um, supportive of what Creative Commons is all about. So, without much further ado, I'd love to hand the floor to you to hear your presentation, and we'll take some questions once uh, once we have the presentation. So, thank you, Audrey. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, good local time, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here virtually uh, at a summit uh, to support the, the Creative Commons. And this is my slides. I hope I got the image right uh, of this is a global summit. Uh, so this is about digital social innovation, uh, which is you know everyone's business with everyone's help uh, digitally. Uh, and this is how Taiwan counted the pandemic. Um, yesterday were another zero COVID day, so far with no lockdowns, and also countered the infodemic with no takedowns. And I like to share a few just anecdotes during not just the pandemic, but also uh, the times of Taiwan's um, post sunflower movement, uh, digital democracy. And I look forward to the Q&A and the fireside chat. Now, social innovation depends on, in my opinion, three pillars, and that's fast, fair, and fun. The fast part is about collective intelligence. It's about a public infrastructure in the digital space that people can contribute signal over noise very easily and quickly. Now, in Taiwan, we've had like 25 years of this forum called the PTT, which is like Reddit, but it's not Reddit because it has no shareholders, it has no advertisers. It's just a National Taiwan University student pet project run wild uh, for 25 years. So in 2019, December, for example, uh, when Dr. Li Wenlong from Wuhan uh, shared on their social media that there were, and I quote, seven SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market, although it didn't reach uh, the globe uh, so quickly and indeed didn't reach people in Wuhan at all, it did reach the PTT and within 24 hours people just contributed, triaged this message so that we uh, in the first day of 2020 began health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan. And so this collective intelligence really served as an advanced warning system where people can contribute on this co-governed GPO V3 space, uh, anything that relates to public interest. So this is a civic tech side, but there's also a government tech side. Now, in our Central Epidemic Command Center, we broadcast a live press conference every 2 p.m. and the minister and the health officers answer all journalists' uh, questions until they run out of questions every day. But it's not just journalists posing questions. Anyone can call this toll-free number 1922 and just chime in with their ideas. And chances are uh, the very next day, 2 p.m., uh, they, they will be answered and all those answers are passed packaged into easy to share memes and so on that are Creative Commons licensed uh, in particular by NCND because this is about science and about the pandemic response. So um, for example, last April, there was a young boy calling 192 saying, hey, you're rationing out masks. And all I got was this pink medical mask, but all the boys in my class got navy blue ma mask. I do something about it. I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day, next 2 p.m., everyone wore pink. The uh, Minister of Health even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the, the most hit boy in the class overnight because only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero where so imagine if uh, the response was like 60 days later then that would not make a cultural difference only when it's responded in the here and now uh, with collective intelligence work uh, to build mutual trust by trusting all the citizens we can get some of the trust back now it also helps to have social innovators working on fairness 
um, in Taiwan, there is a movement called G Zero V that use open source and Creative Commons licenses to fork the government. Now, fork means taking something there into a different direction without destroying what's already there, but into a different direction with the hope that it will be merged back. So, for example, G Zero V forked this idea of mask rationing to display the real-time availability of all the PPEs available in nearby pharmacies last February. And after noticing they did this open source implementations, I talked with the premier and says, we have to trust citizens with real-time open data. And Taiwan's national open data license is Creative Commons attribution. So using CC BY, everyone gets the real-time updated every 30 seconds, um, play by play um, account of all the mask availability. So more than 100 different tools, including chatbots and voice assistants for the um, seeing impaired people and so on. So everyone can um, avoid queuing in vain, uh, but rather just go to the pharmacy to have the mask available. And one year later, this May, the same team, the GovZero team, built this very innovative 1922 SMS check-in system. The idea is that we need to shorten because of the alpha and delta variants contact tracing from 24 hours into 24 minutes. So how to do that? Well, we use a uh, QR code in the um, front door of every venue, but there's no app installation required. Even on the iPhone lock screen, you can just point your camera to it. It translates to a SMS, you hit send, and that was what, three, three seconds, and you're done. So this um, has a very good design in the multi-party security um, idea because the telecom only has this random code and cannot correspond that to real addresses. The venues know their random code, but unless the contact tracer asks for it, they will not hand it out. And the person doing the scanning, well, they only trust um, their telecom, of course, so their whereabouts is only stored in the telecoms and also in a randomized fashion. So in the multi-party design, unless all the three uh, parties join together automatically by authorized contact tracers uh, individually, these pieces of information do not uh, compromise privacy. And the entire design is co-created online. Uh, the transcript actually is Creative Commons uh, by the G0V community. Again, this very effectively um, made our contact tracing work so that we can reach zero COVID very quickly. Now, also, uh, the ideas of humor over rumor also works very well because the idea of memes is that it makes the idea worth spreading well spread. So when we have, for example, people worrying about the uh, um, masks uh, effectiveness, which is an issue in other countries, uh, or physical distancing and so on, uh, the Ministry of Health actually have this spokesdog and a team of professional comedians uh, who are themselves public servants or work closely with public servants. Well, the participation officer, as we call them, uh, lives physically with this dog, the Shiba Inu, a cute um, Shiba Inu named Zong Chai. And so Zong Chai would say, for example, when you're indoor, keep um, three Shibas away from one another, outdoor keep two Shibas. Remember to cover your mouth and nose. And what does a mask do? Well, a mask protect you against your own unwashed hands. And because of this mimetic virality, as we all know, the internet is built for cute cats and dogs. Uh, the scientific information reached far more people than conspiracy theories. And that's made everyone uh, focus on the shared values and so on. And this builds on the Creative Commons infrastructure that we have been doing for quite a while. Um, this is a Taiwan presidential office. It's shared on the Taiwan Digital Asset Library, the entire 3D scan, uh, along with the dot, uh, the dot cloud uh, photogrammetry of the historical heritage sites uh, as um, CC models that everyone can download and remix into their games. Uh, our dictionaries, national dictionaries, are uh, available under ND because they're, well, dictionaries. And even uh, my portraits uh, that uh, the professional photographers takes of me, um, the, my only condition of accepting uh, these photo shots is that they are creative li commons licensed. So again, this builds on this public infrastructure in the digital space that maximizes remixing and reuse. And as a minister that practice radical transparency, 
everything, all the lobbyist meetings, all the journalist meetings, even internal meetings uh, that are interagency that I chair are available online under CC0 or public domain. And this is really helpful because not only I can remember uh, my uh, more than 106 100 meetings with 6,500 people uh, better is like an external memory, but it also made all the lobbyists and journalists talk to me uh, with the position of a good enough ancestor. That is to say they don't lobby for things that sacrifice other people's interests or sacrifice future generations' interests because they know that they will be in the public domain uh, for the record forever, uh, immediately free of copyright. So everybody tends to argue from the positions uh, that furthers the global benefit, it changes the course of conversation. And this is my office, by the way, Taiwan's Social Innovation Lab is a park. Uh, we tear down the walls, anyone can enter this park. And we also use another uh, AGPL um, software. It's like a town hall, but in the digital space. So think of my office, but uh, translated online. And we use AI in this context, meaning assistive intelligence that connects people, not machines, uh, in Polish, the GOV.TW. Again, this is not G0V now, this is GOV, so public infrastructure maintained by the state. Uh, and you're looking at a real conversation in 2015 around the UberX phenomena. Uh, people feel very differently about the sharing economy slash gig economy slash platform economy. But we make sure that we share the facts using open data, again, in Creative Commons attribution, and use this um, platform polis to ask people's feelings. And then all those feelings that resonated with one another became good ideas that we then translate into policy. So as you can see, this is a social media, but not a anti-social social media, but rather a pro-social social media. There's no reply button, so no room for troll to grow. And if you click agree on my um, idea that passenger liability insurance is important, you move toward me. But if you disagree, you move, well, away from me, but there's no reply button. And once you click agree or disagree, there's another uh, sentiment for you to react. And of course, at any time you can post your own sentiments again to release this open data for other people to resonate. So this is a shape of a pro-social social media. Um, of course, we table some ideological differences, but most people agree with most of their neighbors most of the time on most of the points. So actually, after three weeks of consultation, everybody said, yeah, sure, uh, we can make multi-purpose taxis as long as they don't undercut existing meters. We should enable local temples and churches to build their own virtual Uber and so on. And that led to a very quick, um, swift uh, ratification of this crowdsource law or crowd law. And this is in SDG global goal terms. This is the measurement of progress that is truly crowdsourced. So I would say that this remixing culture, this infrastructure on um, free as in freedom software and open innovation as epit epitomized by the Creative Commons community is a, a novel way to think of democracy, not as a you know, slow bit rate uploading three bits every four years, every person, uh, which is called voting, but rather a continuous democracy that everybody can adapt democracy as a social technology to increase the bit rate so we can find the common values and based on the common values deliver open innovations. Five years ago, when I became Taiwan's first digital minister, well, they asked me, what am I doing? And I'm like, oh, I, my work is just 1717 SDG, effective partnership 1718, reliable data 176, open innovation. And the HR people said, um, minister, nobody memorized the UN goals uh, by their digits. So I had to translate that into pr uh, poetry, and I'll just read it for you now, uh, and that would conclude my 15 minutes opening remark. So my job description goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, Let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, well, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. And thank you for sharing, Audrey. That was a 
beautiful um, uh, ending to what is, you know, just a, a tour de force of a presentation. Um, maybe I can start, I'm just looking at the chat to let people come in. You know, what's been your greatest learning from the pandemic? Um, you've, you know, you've been in, in, in the position you're saying for five years and the challenge that you have just faced and the solutions you've talked about. Love to know more about what you think has been the greatest learning that you've had over the past 18 months yeah, to um, two years. So to, um, the main idea is to give no trust is to get no trust. If we ah, trust yeah. the social yeah. sector, if you trust the people closest to the pain, to come up with new innovations, then the state road changes. Instead of having to fix everything, we're essentially a place where jams, crowdsourcing happen, and we amplify the not best, maybe better practices, as I mentioned, 24 hours after each innovation happens. So it requires this commitment to um, agile governance of saying, okay, we were wrong 24 hours ago and here comes a better idea and fully credit the civic technologies. That has been the most important thing because if we only change course every quarter as governments often do, we will not be able to keep up with the speed of mutation of the virus. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that today you're sitting you know, here with us and you've mm -hmm. got zero cases of COVID, zero. zero. It's, it's mm -hmm. remarkable. I mean, and, and you know, congratulations to, to that achievement because that is no mean feat. That is an incredible achievement to have done that. And and to evidence with what you have just told us about, about how you how you did that, that 24 hours to 24 minutes, the, the importance of speed for information is 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 really something that I think we can all um, all all learn from, and uh, I think uh, there's some people in the chat and sitting here listening to you who are kind of wishing they were uh, with you, where where you are the minister of digital, uh, able to to make this change, you know. And we're all mm -hmm. I think it feels very much that we're sitting in an analog world where you're actually truly in, you know, a digital reality that's working, and maybe that's something. I mean, how how are you um, providing the skills for people to be able to use digital? I mean, that's something that we are always kind of challenged by mm -hmm. about skills, mindset, governments also in mindsets in terms of how digital democracy works in practice. What could you share with us, Audrey, about your experiences? Sure. I think it boils down to two things. One is broadband as a human right. And yeah. another is competence instead of literacy. Yes. So I'll explain a little bit. Broadband in Taiwan is truly a human right. Anyone, even on the tip of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, is eligible for uh, at least 10 megabits per second, good enough for a video conference, for just 15 euros a month. So there's no surcharge uh, on the data rights. Everybody is on broadband at all times. I remember a time when, um, I think a few months ago, someone in the quarantine space near the Yangming Mountain wrote me an email saying, Minister, this took me five hours to send. I mean, this quarantine space and I cannot watch a uh, streaming video and you uh, committed uh, yourself into broadband as human right. I'm suffering from a human right abuse. Do something about it. And so uh, in just a couple of weeks, we built a new telecom relay tower near the Yangming Mountain. Of course, by that time, that person is already out of quarantine, but he made a point of driving back and measure the speed test and posting online to hold me accountable. So that's our commitment. The second thing, though, is that in middle school, for example, a lot of students during our presidential debates, instead of asking them to read about the presidential debate coverage and do media literacy classes, they're invited to fact check the three presidential candidates in real time as they're doing their forum and debate. So they become producers of media, remixer of media, not just consumer of media. Yes. And many um, primary schoolers contribute to climate science by measuring the air quality and publishing it on a distributed ledger. Again, learning about data stewardship, not just analyzing whatever data yeah. other people collected. Yeah, yeah. And that way you've got buy-in, you learn from doing, you know. You, you mentioned, I think, 
when you're talking about how you've led as as an agile leader, which is listening, learning, and adapting. Mm -hmm. And I think agile leadership is is fascinating because it's also about how you're managing change. Because um, you, you know, and you talked about trust. I mean, how have you found managing change? You've come in and and, and driven change. You know, you embody mm -hmm. kind of the, the the digital change that we need to see in other countries and in terms mm -hmm. of Taiwan. How did you do it? You know, mm -hmm. everyone turns to you, I think, and asks the question: What can we learn, and how can we bring what you have done mm -hmm. in Taiwan to to other countries in an effect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, most of our contributions uh, actually require no broadband, the SMS in particular, and yeah. also the mass rationing map uh, via chatbots. And well, it, it's all on, on GitHub and GitLab, and yeah. many jurisdictions uh, just adapt um, this code and do their own thing. And I, I do think, though, that the, the key to Taiwan model is not a, a system of code, but rather a system of culture. And this yeah. culture, I think of the, the German an autobahn system. I was there a yeah. year when I was yeah. 11, uh, where there's no speed limit. But <laughs> interestingly, because of the strong norm and the high competence of the drivers and the road, of course, uh, you actually feel safer and probably is safer the faster yes. you go. So it's swift and it's safe. So there's no false trade-off between you know moving fast but breaking things and fixing things but doing slow, right? So we can move fast and fix things if we yeah. build this what I call people-public-private partnership. It's yeah. a civil society, the social sector, the Creative Commons and FLOS yeah. community doing this fast part. But once it gains popular legitimacy, it's the yeah. state's duty to amplify those ideas and then tell the private sector, okay, you've got to implement those norms as we did yeah. to the five telecom carriers. Yes, yes, that's Thank you so much, Audrey. And now there's some things in the chat. We've got, um, oh, well, John is saying competence instead of literally just change my project's keywords. So I, I, you're, you're inspiring um, change even, even in the chat. Um, Nate said, I keep changing singular literacy to plural literacies. Might we think of competencies too? Wonder what you think about that question, Audrey, about competencies as well as literacy. Yeah. So I, I think so too. I, I mean, literacy is, is of course very important. One of the uh, most interesting thing is that um, what, what we're doing now is to build this uh, maker mindset into mm -hmm. not just basic, but also lifelong education. So uh, what we're doing is instead of asking people to uh, read the textbooks or standardize on standardized answers or things like that. What we're doing is to ask them to build their own textbook, co-create their textbooks. So I, I don't think I'm writing off this idea of literacy, but rather just flipping it around and say, uh, anything that you produce as a byproduct of your learning has the potential to be the source material for somebody else learning the same thing. Think of uh, our programming classes, for example, almost uh, no a primary schooler learned programming from, from uh, blank state. They learned from Scratch, uh, the, the programming environment Scratch, the Lego inspired environment. And so they start by playing games essentially and then changing the Lego figure, the protagonist to look like themselves. And that's probably mm -hmm. the first line of change. <laughs> and then they just hit publish. And then uh, the other uh, students in the other schools and so on all then look uh, to this uh, creative commons license materials and then made them their textbook. So literacy is, uh, of course, the first step. What I'm trying to say is that we want to shorten the height of the ladder. So going from literacy to competence is a matter of minutes. Yes, yes. I think there's a couple more. There's what Nate's come back and said, yes, literacy seems more focused on consumption rather than producing activity. And then there's Jim has come in and says, does the radical CCO transparency or CC0 transparency in meetings with journalists and lobbyists tend to decrease in inequality? So that's into does the radical transparency meeting with journalists with the, the CC0 license and lobbies tend to decrease inequality? What what's what right. your thoughts, right. Audrey? Yeah, it tends to increase, as I mentioned, uh, this commitment to common yeah. purpose. Yes. So, yeah. um, because people understand 
that even in the drafting stage, like the ideation stage, which is usually closed off in administrations unless you file a FOIA request, which takes ages, right? In any jurisdiction, a freedom of information uh, request. This is us proactively saying, okay, this is our drafting stage and we might miss something. So let me know if we missed anything. So yeah. the camera or the tape recorder or the stenographer in the same room basically stands for the entire yeah. internet, everyone yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who are um, stakeholder to this particular conversation, even though they're not in the same room, even though yeah. they didn't know of this meeting, can go retroactively to look at a transcript and then just email me or post on online forum saying, okay, this is a, a better idea. So it makes a, a positive sum game out of politics because previously if we don't publish these materials, yeah. people who are not in a room will are automatically excluded. Yes, yes. And that thing about if you're excluded, then where do you get trust from that? And being included is more, I think you used the quote that um, about government information, that if it's not all open, then you're, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, your, your radical openness actually builds trust and you can evidence that, which is really interesting compared to other governments where information you know, you have to use freedom of information requests to get things, and often there's barriers to having open information. Um, so I think that's you know something which we certainly all can learn from uh, from Taiwan's experience of that radical openness. Is there anything you know in terms of that openness that you've you know you've again learned about how to do it better because you've kind of opened mm -hmm. information, but you're making it mm -hmm. even more accessible. Is mm -hmm. it, is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the most important stakeholder here is definitely the career public service. Uh, the, the argument I make to them is often this. Look, if you have to uh, give out information anyway because of the Freedom of Information Act, yeah. the, the chance uh, of you getting the blame by red acting the wrong things and things like that are, are high if you go the FOIA route. But if you yeah. simply tell uh, your system vendor saying, okay, the mask availability, well, as soon as the machine collects it, just publish it online before yes. I even have a chance to review. Then yeah. uh, interestingly, when the data shows bias or is simply wrong, the public service gets no blame because they didn't even think about it or look at it. It's just an automated pipeline. So when it when there is a bias, for example, the, when we published the mask rationing map, uh, we thought uh, that we did a good job because the pharmacy's allotment uh, coincides precisely with the population center. So we think it's fair. But then yeah. the OpenStreetMap community, another Creative Commons ally, uh, pointed out, no, it's not the case. Via a legislator, they said, well, if you are in a rural place, you have to, on the same map distance, spend three hours to get to that pharmacy. But if you're in an urban area, then you spend 30 minutes. So it's not the same, even though on the map, it looks like the same distance. Not everyone own a helicopter. But yeah. it, because, we, because we publish in real time, they were able to not just um, you know, demonstrate and protest, but demonstrate as in demo by proposing yeah. a better allocation method and pre-registration, which is turned then into policy just 24 hours after. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is that without the chance of co-creation and real-time API, the public service always to blame if things are wrong. But if you publish yeah. in real time, even before you had a chance to review it, well, you just invite all the trolls oh, as co-creator, hug the yeah. trolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. And it's about, again, thinking about how openness and, you know, really can make that difference, both in terms of, you know, getting information to people that's necessary, but also building that trust and, uh, and, and, and bringing, bringing civil servants with you on that journey, which is, uh, which is really remarkable. Mary's put in mm -hmm. something in the chat about, you know, she really liked the injection of um, humor and um, and whimsy. It's so cool in terms of how you've got a serious message, but with you, the, the, the dogs that you had in that okay, picture, how, dogs. the memes. How do you ensure people take that message she's asking seriously? Well, the, the point is not to take the message seriously. The point, the point of <laughs> memes is idea was spreading, right? So making sure the yeah. idea was spreading, spread. And interestingly, when people get in the in the in, in the humorous mood, uh, it takes all the tensions off mm. from outrage. 
because without these cute dogs to share and, and maybe to to satirize, to ridicule its Creative Commons, do whatever, right? But without these, uh, people very easily turn those energy in the more antisocial corner of social media into revenge and discrimination. So mm. uh, both this uh, humor and revenge discrimination share the same energy. It's this energy of outrage, of going viral, but this channels it into a place where people can then think better about how to co-create. So by itself, these memes do not co-create things, but it puts people in a mood of co-creation. Which is, you know, it takes people to a different place rather than that, you know, what you described about Ridicule. But I think it's good to hear your experiences about how, how, um, how humour and that whimsy helped you get a serious message across and that mm -hmm. is that's an interesting learning. Um, oh, another another question here. Maybe the start of an answer to your kit about the uh, more more humor more, more humor less outrage. Um, says Jonathan. But maybe could talk a little bit about the importance of what you are doing in terms of an open society, because mm -hmm. when we're thinking about digital democracy and the debates around direct democracy and what that means. You know, we've seen the statement that the G seven about open societies, the importance where what digital plays in some of this. What what do you think is again the learning that we can have about the importance of open processes within the new reality that we're existing with to support open societies? Yes, this is an excellent question. When I think of open societies, as I mentioned, I think of plurality. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, instead of optimizing we know pre uh, premature optimization is the root of all love uh, all evil right so instead of optimizing or solving any particular thing what's important is that people understand the general principles and the toolkits so they yeah. can apply it to whatever emergent uh, things that happens to them that occurs to them this is to say instead of just a few elites um, getting the control of whatever machine learning algorithm or authoritarian intelligence there which may look efficient but is not effective actually overall we should make sure that the people even the primary schoolers uh, yeah. feel they are competent that they can look at whatever problem they're facing, apply something that already goes 90% of the way yeah. from Scratch or GitHub or something, and just tweak a few parameters and make yeah. everyone around them slide better. I believe this is what an open society means. And this is well, uh, what I think of when I think of the word democratization. It doesn't yeah. just mean it's, it's cheaper and easier to access as this century's use of democratization seem to mean. Yeah. But last century's use of democratization of people coming to terms of making decisions that affects them together. Yeah. And you, 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 what is fascinating, Audrey, you, you, you talk about schools, you talk about children, you, you touched a little bit in your talk about intergenerational. Maybe mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit more about intergenerational justice, because sure. what you're describing is about not just about thinking about the present and responsibilities mm -hmm. of governance, but also thinking about the future. Um, and I think that is a real testament to you and your leadership. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I think the next generation or the generation comes after seven generations, they, they don't have a vote, right? So in traditionally uh, representative democracy, they tend to be discounted. Even people who are under 18 are discounted if you just count the votes. And in Taiwan, uh, we have this, as I mentioned, participation officers who, uh, in addition of rolling out cute dog memes, are in charge of holding collaborative <laughs> meetings with people who petition online. So anyone who collect 5,000 signatures uh, from very young people, actually, that works from residents, not necessarily citizens, for the um, future humanity and the environment, as long as they got 5,000 signatures, can, just like a legislator interpolation, uh, collaborate point by point with the ministers and the participation officers and indeed more than one quarter of our of our citizen initiatives this way on the join the GOV the TW platform were started by people who are not adults who are under 18 like a very popular one to ban plastic straws from the yeah. um, our national drink bubble tea that came from a 17 year old girl really oh wow yes. well you know we, we we've had a huge plastic straw debate and 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 uh, 
in 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 the UK as well, which is probably stemmed from that seventeen year old talking about kind of the you know to think about practical ways to save the environment. Maybe That's this right. is a nice way to think about how what you've learned with COVID and dealing with the COVID crisis. How are you applying that now to the climate emergency in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. what, what are the things that you're doing? Yeah, in, in Taiwan, uh, every year we hold this annual event called the Presidential Hackathon. Uh, instead of a, a more um, shorter hackathon that runs only a couple of days, this runs three months, so a very long marathon hackathon. Uh, and what, what this uh, entails is that the five champions out of like more than 200 teams each year uh, get a trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. And this trophy, Shape of Taiwan, is a microprojector. If you turn it on, it projects uh, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen handing you the trophy, so it's very meta. <laughs> but this trophy means uh, that the president is committed as a presidential platform. Whatever your idea that has worked in a pilot study in the three months uh, time, we're committed to, in the next 12 months, make it a national policy. And last year, all the five champions work on climate action. Obviously, yeah. it's an important thing in Taiwan. We've got, for example, uh, people using augmented reality to pre-commit the entire community into voluntarily planting and maintaining the, the trees in their neighborhood. Uh, we've got people inventing apps that uh, push notifies you when there could be a heat damage to you uh, because of the climate change and inspire you to uh, take whatever bottles you have on the nearby drinking places is like a Pokemon game you can check in and collect coins and then learn about you know not uh, creating new plastic waste and also local social entrepreneurs uh, and things like that so uh, basically each one have to correspond to one or more of the sustainable goals and we use a new voting method called quadratic voting so nobody loses so people express their preferences and the best teams uh, get commitments but the teams that didn't get it um, didn't uh, make the cut eventually join uh, the teams that did make the cuts uh, to make those okay. policies work. So it's totally collaborative. You that's know? exactly right. Yes. That's, uh, that's fast. So the people that maybe didn't, as you say, make the cut are, are also then participating in making the change. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, because the quadratic voting shows the synergies between the yes, projects. Yes. Can, I'm very keen. I'm just seeing if there's any more questions uh, coming up in the chat. But you mentioned participatory um, uh, officers, and you mentioned that when any, you know someone wants to make a change, it's a they could do a petition with just five thousand signatures. So I'm just you know in many other democracies, it's the bar is far higher, and also we don't have people who are actively supporting the participation curious to know how how you know what's what's the qualification to be a participatory um officer and, 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 and what, how does that work in practice sure well, we've written about it uh, in a national uh, regulation, uh, and you're, you're free to to copy it uh, in your jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, the directions of participation officers um, said that the uh, um, POs who are always under the direct supervision of a deputy agency head or chief information officer um, can assign their own personnel flexibly uh, to uh, undertake the duty, right? So the idea is that this lateral communication, a learning uh, environment where you're uh, comfortable with stepping out of the, uh, your comfort zone is the main requirement. I think of, for example, the collaborative design of the tax filing experience. Yeah. Those breakout conversations, uh, which we uh, hold face to face, are chaired by people in, say, the Ocean Affairs Council, the, the sea patrols, the ocean patrols, uh, who have nothing to do with the Ministry of Finance, but they also file their taxes. So while being a public servant, they firmly take the citizen side when doing public deliberations and town halls because they're not of that particular agency. But when it, the times comes that we talk about our ocean policy uh, to enable surfing and other amateur fishing activities, well, it's the Minister of Finance participation officer holding those discussions and who, of course, are not entrenched in the silo of the Ocean Affairs Council, uh, but they serve themselves. So the idea is that we need to learn, yes, participation officers from the vantage point of being an average citizen, but of course, train in public service knowledge.
Yeah, but you're never losing the focus of the citizen in what yes. you're doing, which is exactly. really interesting um, and and quite fundamental. Um, I'm I'm just looking again at the chat. I'm kind of uh, I think Cat Welsh said the only U.S. government agency I've really seen use humour is the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and then their Twitter account is great. So we'll have to check that out, Cat. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know it's it's good to see other examples as well. But in terms of you know, Audrey, who who are you looking out to in this world today? I mean, people are always coming to you about kind of who's inspiring you at the moment in terms of innovation and democratic, uh, in, in terms of open innovation within democracies in the globe? Well, everyone in the free and open culture community, of course. <laughs> as, as, I I <laughs> no, as, as I mentioned, I, I, I share my own likeness, uh, ranging from CC0 to uh, yeah. by as a um, online. So I wake up every day and see my likeness being remixed into weird and interesting memes. <laughs> and I think uh, this this is really interesting to me because it shows that people care about public yes. policy. And often the angle that they use the memes uh, holds tremendous potential for us to communicate our next policy uh, to the population. So this is truly a co-creative idea where I make myself into a source material, right? For everyone to remix. Uh, people in Japan, for example, there was a hip hop band called Dos Monos that takes an interview like the one we're doing and sample the sound into a rap without my knowledge. And, and, and I learned a lot from that too. Yeah, yeah, no, completely. Now, Jim has come in with a question about how would you compare the magnitude of the climate risk to inequality risk? What What are your thoughts on that, Audrey? Well, it, it feeds to one another, right? Yeah. The, the climate uh, urgency, the climate crisis is already creating uh, inequalities worldwide. And it requires people to think beyond jurisdictions because certainly carbon dioxide doesn't know about <laughs> jurisdictions even even more so than, than computer virus and biological virus, right? So what, what I'm trying to say is that if we think of the climate urgency, as a way for the global neighborhood to act upon the kind of yeah. uh, communication collaboration structure we already have for the common urgency of infodemic and the pandemic, which is already in place, and take that through presidential hackathons. Indeed, this year we had a international track focus on climate action. And, and nothing else, right? Uh, as a way to to basically rebuild the global neighborhood around this idea of what people call polylateralism or multi-stakeholderism, yes. uh, then that is a tremendous chance to approach it from an equity and equality perspective, but internationally, not just domestically. Yes, and Nate has come in and said, or are these risks so intertwined? That's exactly what you were saying. They are intertwined. Right. Yeah. Be brought, brought together, mm -hmm. which is 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 so interesting. Um, again, I'm just checking that we don't have any uh, hidden questions in the CUNY that I have not seen. Um, I, I'm just having a quick look um, as I scroll down. Nope, nope, nope. We're good. We're good. Um, so, Audrey, you know, we've got uh, just 15 minutes left. Um, I'm just, yeah, you know, um, thinking a little bit more about what practical advice you would give oh there's Matthew's come in as well and um, what about, about SDGs um, mm -hmm. what practical advice would you give to other countries to adopt mm -hmm. what you have led in Taiwan what would be your three top pieces of advice to give to those countries to move forward with the kind of changes you've implemented and shown an evident success with well the three advice is pin on my Twitter is called fast fair and fun. And these, these three uh, must be done simultaneously, but you can start small. You don't have to do this national level. You can start with a, literally a town hall in a town and that works pretty well. The police um, pro-social uh, social media uh, picture that I show you uh, is actually um, Bowling Green, Kentucky, uh, USA, if I'm not mistaken. So as you can see, uh, they talk about essentially not any of the national topics, but strictly yeah. local topics. Uh, the top consensus, this red spot yeah. says, uh, instead of STEM, let's make it STEAM. So not just science, tech, uh, engineer, and math, but rather the arts, 
an important component, and that's as to the competence mindset, right? That people need to create. So whether they identify as quote unquote Republican or quote unquote Democrat doesn't matter. Everybody yeah. feel the same in this small town about the odds. More choices in broadband supply. Again, who would be against it? So these are the lower hanging fruits. And once people see that it is possible to have a town hall in the digital realm, it changes this town's perspective on things because previously people are led to believe that they can only talk about those public matters in the digital equivalent of a smoke-filled nightclub, right? Which is like Facebook, uh, where people sell addictive drinks, private bouncers, they have to shout to get heard and so on. And with all due respect, I mean, the nightlife district contribute to society, but they are not a place to hold a town hall. So we need yeah. to invest in digital public infrastructures that are fast, fair and fun, but start yeah. small. Yes. So I think the big takeaway we have to, to, to from your talk is fast, fair and fun. I loved your um, Internet of Beings, the shared reality, mm. collaborative experience and human experience wasn't that was human experience as well wasn't it as well you said audrey which is mm -hmm. really pivotal to that citizen shaping the policy that allows um change again to happen matthew's come in and said there are a bit of discussion before about maker education the undp is very keen on using accelerator mm -hmm. labs to realize that the sdgs and i wonder whether taiwan has experimented with maker spaces and fab labs mm -hmm. to focus upon yeah some of the goals. Definitely. I, I made my keyboard in a in a fab lab. So <laughs> <right>. <laughs> laser cut it. <laughs> right. So the, I think uh, in Taiwan, the, the maker education has a lot going for it because we're very strong in manufacturing yeah. on semiconductors, uh, on making sure that all the optical and the acoustic uh, components can be tailor made to the school's needs. So a lot of people build robots uh, yeah. that automate a lot of the school's chores and so on. And nothing feels better uh, than the student contributing via Lego models uh, to their school, right? So, yeah. so I, I believe this, uh, the younger you start, actually, the, the better it, it gets. Because if in the first few years of school life, the students learn that the programmers um, doesn't control everything and they can also customize it to their heart's will, then they bring this spirit to pretty much all the discipline they are learning. If on the other hand, in the first few years in school, they learned that, oh, the tablet maker, the, the Chromebook uh, maker, the textbook maker, uh, pre-program everything and we must follow existing tracks. Again, they build a learn helplessness. Yes, yes. But thank you for talking about your own experience with, uh, mm -hmm. with Baker Spaces because that is yeah. truly inspiring. Now, I'm just mm -hmm. checking in the chat if there's any more questions for Audrey, because I think we're coming towards the end of the the the, the conversation and the end of the hour. We're slowly speeding up to that. Um, I'm not seeing any direct questions. Kat and Alison, if there's anything that you're seeing that I'm not seeing, please feed in. But, you know, Audrey, I can't thank you enough for um, all the support you've given to Creative Commons uh, over the years and showing how you mm -hmm. are using Creative Commons in your day-to-day -day work to make a difference. Um, yeah, all questions are coming through the chat, that's great. And so I would like everyone to show their appreciation on the chat, if that's okay to Audrey, because as you know, we can't hear people clapping, but please show your appreciation to Audrey for her inspiring talk today, for all that she is doing to make a difference to the citizens in Taiwan, but also the inspiration you are making globally, Audrey, with your openness to show how open solutions are the way forward to impose, to, 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 to have trust, to make sure our citizens are heard, and also fundamentally that we're thinking about the future generation and that, in that aspect of intergenerational justice, which we see in every part of what you are doing. So thank you so much for your time today. It's our 20th anniversary at Creative Commons, and I can't think of a better speaker than yourself to show and celebrate the work about what we've done in the past 20 years, but what the possibilities are of the next. And so it's just tremendously inspiring. You can see all of these um, comments, Audrey, that are coming in. So thank you for your time today. And um, and have uh, keep doing what you're doing and keep inspiring. So thank you, Audrey. Yeah. And, thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to meet again uh, in a personal uh, Creative yes. Commons Summit. We have to work on that. And until then, live long and prosper, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Thank you.